Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the Educational Talk Series. Um, I'm Megan Smith. I run New Business Development uh, and a couple other things um, here at Google. And um, what's what? one thing that's very true about Google, we love entrepreneurs and we love education and teachers. And so today's an incredible day because we have Wendy Kopp here, who's the founder and CEO of Teach for America and has extended that now out into Teach for All. Um, just wanted. To, there's an incredible Googler named Ed Liu. Um, he's he's since uh, graduated and is off to other things. But he's an astronaut and the number four American for time and space. Um, he's been on the space station and various shuttles and um, and the Soyuz. One of the things that was interesting to me when I was talking to him was he said that on his very first shuttle launch, he made a point to contact every teacher he could find who had ever taught him, and invited them to the launch. And that little vignette story, just like everyone in this room can think of all of your teachers and especially the extraordinary master teachers who touched our lives and got us to where we are. Um, and one of the things that's true is, uh, you know, talent is universal and opportunity is not, as Rye Barcott says. And one of the key things is which teachers you get and the kind of schools that you get to go to and the kind of educational opportunities you have matter a lot. And Wendy is such an extraordinary entrepreneur who uh, Teach for America just celebrated its 20th anniversary, um, saw that vision and figured out a way to pull the talent, first in America and now working with colleagues around the world, pull the top talent. Some of the top talent was going to teaching, but some were doing other things, you know, and could we get more people into teaching? And so that was her vision. And uh, the numbers are astounding. Um, there's 8,000 teachers right now in uh, the two-year course, um, half a million students, 20,000 alumni. So there are Googler alumni, Teach for America alumni here. I know we have many in the Google team, but time and schedules, there's some. Terrific. Welcome. Probably some on VC. Um, but this year, 27% of the Spelman graduating class applied for Teach for America. 15% of the Princeton class, 18% uh, of the Harvard graduating class. The opportunity to pull top talent out of uh, the US graduates um, is here. And Wendy's pulled that together with her team. Um, she's also a pretty busy, crazed person. I know she has four children um, who are ages 3 to 11. We have young boys, so I know that's an amazing uh, thing to do. And so. Just without further ado, I wanted to welcome her. We're really looking forward to hearing from you. And we are already collaborating on technology things, curriculum, working together. We will help funding. We'll keep help funding. Um, but tell us more things that you want us to do and need to see in the world. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm so excited to have the chance to talk with you all about um, really what I've learned. Um, over the last 20 years and what it's led me, you know, why it's led me and my colleagues uh, to feel really a greater sense of urgency than ever and a greater sense of possibility than ever um, that we can actually one day, if we make the right choices, reach the day when all kids in our country have the chance to attain an excellent education. Um, as, as Megan described, I got into this a little over 20 years ago now. Um, I was a senior in college at Princeton, and our generation was called the me generation. Some of you, you probably aren't old enough to be part of the quote me generation. Um, I felt like that label was completely misplaced. I felt like I was one of thousands of graduating seniors who were just searching for a way to, you know, assume a real responsibility that would make a real difference in the world. And I thought the problem wasn't the generation, but really the recruiters. Um, like at the time, every recruiter going after liberal arts grads like myself at, at Princeton uh, were corporations asking us to commit two years to go work in their training programs on Wall Street and whatnot. Um, and I'd been very focused on as a public policy major and just a concerned college student, just the fact that still in our country, where kids are born determines their educational outcomes and in turn life outcomes in, in a country that aspires to be a land of opportunity. Um, and one day this all led me to this idea, you know, why aren't we being recruited as aggressively to commit our first two years out of college to teach in our highest poverty communities as we were being recruited to spend our first two years 
working on Wall Street. Um, and I thought that would make a huge difference for kids growing up today, just channeling all this talent and energy into classrooms in our most economically disadvantaged communities. And at the same time, I thought, you know, how powerful would that be for the priorities of a generation to have your first two years be teaching in high poverty communities rather than you know, working on Wall Street. And I thought in the end that would make a huge difference on the choices they made every year thereafter, on our overall kind of decision making and consciousness as a country. So that was the big idea. I needed a thesis topic and decided to propose this. And it was just clearly one of those things that was very quickly far beyond me. Um, it, it magnetized, even in the first year, just, you know, thousands of people, 2,500 graduating seniors. I mean, I think about what would have happened if there was, you know, email back then. Um, but, you know, flyers under doors and we had 2,500 graduating seniors. That's impossible to believe. I'm clearly getting old. But, um, and, and, you know, as well, you know, just tremendous folks in urban and rural communities across the country who hired those, those people and came together to train them um, for our first training institute. And people in corporate America who donated two and a half million dollars to this woman straight out of college um, to support this endeavor. Um, so that was just the first year. And, and it's, that's probably you know the most widely told story of Teach for America. But the real story began after our first core of 500 teachers um, started teaching uh, in six urban and rural communities across the country. Um, and the last 20 years have been just an incredible learning curve. Um, as we've learned from our teachers and then our alumni, many, many of whom, you know, 65% of whom have stayed working full time in education, many others of whom have gone into other things but are still working uh, in endeavors that relate in some way to schools or, or low-income communities. Um, and I really stepped back at our 20th year to write this book, A Chance to Make History, um, as a way of communicating what I've learned from our teachers and our alumni and our colleagues um, in urban and rural communities across the country. Um, so I thought I would just share with you all a few of um, of the key, I guess, most salient lear learnings of this work um, and, and then really look forward to engaging in, in a discussion. Um, so this book, uh, A Chance to Make History, takes its title actually from one of our teachers, Megan Brousseau, who um, just finished her two years teaching in the Bronx this past year. She walked into her four classes of 112 ninth graders in the Bronx um, and said to them, this is your chance to make history. Now, her kids were almost all living below the poverty line. Almost all had learned or were learning English as a second language. 20% um, of them were reading more than three years behind grade level. And almost all of them were behind in their you know, basic reading and math skills. They'd had very little exposure to science. She's supposed to teach them biology. And she called upon them to take and pass the New York State Regents exam in biology. This is a test you don't have to take, and few kids in the Bronx actually take and pass this exam. Um, but she determined that, irrespective of where they were starting out, you know, that it was important that they actually get to that point. She thought if they could take and pass this exam, they would prove to themselves that they should be on a college track, that they have that potential, and they would prove that to others. And it would influence every course they took thereafter. Um, so I kind of recount the extraordinary act of leadership that Megan engaged in to ultimately you know, meet and exceed that goal. You know, first of all, she got her kids on a mission to get there. She convinced them that if they worked hard enough, they could actually reach that goal and that that would matter a lot in their lives. So she got them on a mission. Um, then she went about figuring out how to maximize every second she had with them. She basically had to rewrite the whole curriculum in order to meet her kids where they are, were, meet their different needs, um, and, and move them ahead to this very ambitious goal. It was quite extraordinary to spend time in her classroom. Like You would just feel the sense of urgency and be somewhat overwhelmed with the amount of planning that went into doing the kind of differentiated approach to instruction that she undertook in, in her room. 
he, she then realized she didn't have enough time, of course. Her kids were starting out so far behind. So she convinced many of them to come at 7 in the morning, stay till 6. She had 75% of her ninth graders coming to school every Saturday. Um, and a year later, 112 of her kids had passed this test with an average passing rate of nine percentage points higher than New York City's average, including the scores of all the specialized high school kids in New York, et cetera. Um, I tell her story, I think we can see so much in, in the examples of the Megans of the world. Um, I mean, first of all, she's showing us that we can solve this problem, right? Most people in America think the problem of educational inequity, the fact that you know, we have 15 million kids in our country who are living below the poverty line, half of them will not graduate from high school. The half who do graduate, so the half we're applauding, they're walking across the stage, on average have an eighth grade skill level. We look at that problem and assume that it's, and, and this is speaking as a general rule in our general public, it's such a deeply entrenched, sort of intransigent problem. And yet what Megan's showing us is, you know what, we can solve this. When we meet kids who face all the extra challenges of poverty with high expectations and the extra supports they need to meet their extra needs, they excel. So there's something, of course, very encouraging and motivating about that. And I think, you know, the Megans of the world really create a moral imperative for all of us because they show us that we can solve this problem. And if we can, then, then we must. Another thing about her example and, and many others like hers uh, that I think is so encouraging is she shows us that there's nothing elusive about this. This is not about being born to teach. This is not about some special charisma that we can't replicate. This is about doing things that we can all describe. This is about, I mean, really, Megan did what great leaders do in any undertaking, right? Like she stepped back and said, here's the big vision. She got others to work with her. She operated very purposefully and maximized her time. And then when she encountered obstacles, didn't have enough time with her kids and whatnot, she figured out a way to get more time with her kids. So there's something encouraging about all that. Um, but there's also something pretty daunting about it. Because I've only met so many Megans. Um, I mean, now I've met a couple. No. Um, there are only so many people who can do what Megan Brousseau did um, to make up for all the weaknesses of, of the system, all the extra challenges her kids faced, you know, the lack of capacity of her school. She went to super heroic extents in order to pull off what she did. And I honestly think, like, you get to know the Megan Brousseaus of the world and you think, you know what? This is not the answer, meaning tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Megans is not the answer to solving this problem of educational inequity. What I think is so encouraging, though, about the last 20 years is that we have seen you know, a hugely growing number, maybe there are three or 400 schools now in urban and rural areas that are making it not easy, but easier and more sustainable for talented, committed teachers um, to attain the kind of results that Megan attained. So these schools are taking not just classrooms full of kids, but whole buildings full of kids whose socioeconomic background would predict one thing, and they're putting them on a completely different trajectory so that they are on track to essentially graduate from college at much the same pace as kids in economically privileged communities. Um, and so, you know, many Teach for America alums are kind of in and around this entire movement to create, you know, this new generation of high-performing urban and rural schools. Um, really the first founders of some of the initial uh, schools like this were Teach for America alums. And, and they're hugely responsible for growing the number of them, although They've grown for many reasons far beyond Teach for America. But as a result, I've had the chance to spend lots of time in these schools. Um, and there are many lessons I think we can learn in them. So, you know, first of all, once again, they're showing us what's possible. And, you know, I think about a school, North Star Elementary School in Newark, New Jersey. 
um, working with a student population which we would consider to be you know one of the most impacted student populations in the country African American kids almost all growing up below the poverty line I tell the story in a chance to make history of walking down the halls and seeing student work of kindergartners writing like full page of writing from kindergartners. I don't know if any of you all have kindergarten kids, but I found this to be extremely humbling in both English and Spanish. <laughs> um, like student work that puts the student work in my own kids, Upper West Side of Manhattan, progressive school, to shame, honestly. And of course, even, I mean, the data bears this out. The kids are at the 93rd, 95th percentile on average against the national norm. So. Just as one small example, and we could go on and on, just to give one more example, there's a school called the Idea Academy in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, right across the border from Mexico, working with kids who are growing up in a community known as the Colonia. So, you know, literally uh, kind of makeshift communities where many kids don't have access to running water, electricity. 13% of the parents of the kids graduate from high school. Um, this school has put, you know, some, they're on track to having, of the ninth graders who come into their school, 90 some percent of them graduate from college. Um, it's number 13 on the list of top 100 high schools in America. So what these schools, and, and literally hundreds of others are showing us is, again, as Megan showed us, we can do this, you know, when you provide kids who, who do face extra challenges with the opportunities they deserve, they excel. Um, again, when you spend time in these schools, you also realize there's nothing elusive about what it takes. So what's different about these schools? First of all, they have embraced a very different mandate than most schools have embraced, public or private. Right? Most schools view their job as being, you know, to put learning opportunities in front of kids. Um, you know, the assumption is some kids will really get it and some will sort of get it and some will not get it. And that's just, that's kind of the way our schools work. These schools have embraced a very different mission. You know, in every one of these schools, there's a school leader who has assumed full personal ownership and accountability over ensuring that all of their kids gain the academic skills and the character strength um, necessary to have the option to go to and graduate from college. And that is a very ambitious objective, right? In a world where study after study has shown that socioeconomic background determines educational outcomes, that is a huge, hugely ambitious goal. So then they go at it with the same level of energy and discipline and using the same strategies that really good leaders use when they are pursuing very ambitious goals, meaning they focus tons of energy on recruiting and developing a strong team of teachers and staff members. Um, they're obsessed with it. Like they think about people and how to bring more people into their school building to work with their kids constantly. They go about working with their faculty members to develop a powerful school culture that aligns, it's like a company with a strong culture that aligns everyone on the same mission, right? Like they very intentionally create a school culture that aligns the kids, the kids' parents, the school staff on the same mission. They manage effectively. And again, like Megan, they, they take nothing as a given but the end goal. So when they realize we don't have enough time, they lengthen the school day. Or we need more resources, they partner with others to bring more social services or health services or whatever they need to do inside the building so that they can have a shot at, at meeting their goal. Um, so again, I think there's something so encouraging about that because there's nothing magic about it. Like we know how to do this. So now the question is so different than it was 20 years ago. I mean, again, this is such a young group and you were, some of you, just born probably 20 years ago. But 20 years ago, the prevailing notion was that socioeconomic background, determined educational outcomes, all the research back that up. We've learned that it doesn't have to be that way, that we can intervene in kids' lives and provide what I would call a transformational education, an education that actually changes kids' trajectories. So now knowing that, the question is very different than it was 20 years ago. It's not can we do that, it's 
can we scale that? Like, can we get to the point where we have whole systems of, you know, transformational schools? Even to that question, there's so much reason for optimism out there in our communities today. Um, five years ago, if we had pulled together the big kind of education policy leaders and had asked them to agree on the most impossible to move school systems in the country, we would have had a big debate. We'd probably still be debating, but guaranteed in the top five, we would have said New Orleans and Washington DC public schools. Those are the two fastest improving urban systems in the country today. And I think, I mean, that should give us all hope that never, never should, should we give up entirely because radical, meaningful change for kids is possible. At the same time, you know, we could find a lot of evidence to back up pessimism that we will, in fact, affect real systemic change. And the reason I say that is the statistics I laid out earlier about the extent of the achievement gap, I would have said the same thing 20 years ago. Like, we have not moved the needle against this problem in an, in an aggregate sense. So I think it's worth asking ourselves, you know, why are some communities actually moving the needle in a big way against this problem of educational inequity while the, the aggregate picture has, has yet to move? Um, my personal strongly held theory is that where we're seeing system level progress, I mean, now we know and we can see what is happening in New Orleans, in Washington, D.C., in New York City, which has made dramatic progress. Always what's happening in these communities is that there are leaders at the policy level, at the school system level, who are grounding their choices in the lessons that can be learned in these transformational schools. Um, so when you spend time in these schools, you realize, hmm, couple of big things. First of all, this is all about people. We actually, you can't have a transformational school if you don't have a school leader who assumes responsibility for the big goal and knows how to go about getting there. Um, and they would say they can't do this without the school staff. So hugely, this is hugely about people. Um, and it's also hugely about the kind of accountability point, right? Like these aren't people who show up and go through the motions to put, you know, do whatever a central district tells them to do. These are people who feel have either taken, been given, whatever it is, accountability for getting their kids to a different place and have also taken or been given the flexibility to do whatever it takes to meet the needs of their kids. So in New Orleans and in Washington, D.C., you see school systems that are basing everything on those lessons. They're focusing everything on the questions of how do we attract and develop and hold accountable and empower our educators to get kind of transformational results. We could spend some time asking ourselves why haven't we moved the needle in an aggregate sense? And I would just say, and, and we could have a longer discussion about this, but we, we have not historically grounded all of our decisions in the lessons of these schools and instead have led ourselves out of generally the best of intentions. I mean, we have leaders in our country, political leaders, philanthropists, others who rightly want to solve this problem tomorrow. And as a result, I think we can tend to oversimplify both the problem and the solution a bit. And so we end up kind of lurching from one silver bullet solution to another. And really, if you look at the history of the last 20 years in this, you can go through and say, this was the year of the, and you know now it's the year of the teachers. Like, fix the teachers, we'll solve the problem. And I mean, without elaborating too much, I mean, we're not going to fix, it. it's very hard to be a transformational teacher outside of a school that provides the context, the support, the mission, the team to produce those results. Um, so, so I think there's something, you know, hugely heartening again. I mean, I think we have an unprecedented opportunity in the history of our country, in the history of the world, um, to actually provide all of our kids um, who, who face the challenges of poverty with a transformational education because of the lessons we've learned in the last 20 years. And now it's a question of, you know, will we take advantage of that opportunity? Um, 
If we take a real look at the last 20 years in this effort in the US and ask ourselves, where, you know, where does the transformational change happen for kids when it does happen? You know, so like, if you look at the classroom level, you look at these schools, you look at the school systems, now we're seeing actually a whole generation of state policy changes that are also rooted in the learnings of what happens in these transformational schools. Always we'll see, and this sounds like a fluffy point to make, but if you really go study it, you realize this isn't just fluff, like this is real. Wherever you see meaningful change for kids, you see transformational leaders, meaning, and so think about, I mean, Megan's example. Actually, I had an interesting conversation with Megan who told me that she spent the three weeks before the school year started agonizing over whether or not she should actually do what she did, like walk in on the first day and say, this is your chance to make history. And of course, I mean, she was 21 and she'd never taught. So she was terrified to do that because she thought, what if she can't pull it off and won't that reinforce kids' sense of failure instead of their sense of the possible, et cetera. But she ultimately decided she just had to step up and do it because she thought about the stakes for her kids and what would happen if, if they didn't have the chance to, to do something that bold and that dramatic. Um, you know, then you think about at the school level, at the system level, at the policy level, when you look beneath it, always, always, it's sort of, it's the same story. It's people who, more often than not, because of what they learned as teachers in our urban and rural areas, um, believe so deeply in their kids and have such conviction in what it's going to take to set their more kids up for success that they just decide to do crazy things, like on behalf of their kids. Um, and I think there are huge lessons in this. It's certainly what fuels Teach for America's effort to get much bigger and better, you know, because our mission is just to be a source of transformational leaders. That's why we recruit so aggressively to get people on campuses who are leaders and invest so much to try to help them be transformational teachers and, and then support them and work to accelerate their leadership as alums. So it definitely fuels our efforts to say, actually, Teach for America's growth is fundamental to building an ultimately you know, unstoppable movement to ensure educational opportunity for all in our country. Um, but I also think there are just huge lessons, you know, for all of us. Um, it just, you know, I think you can tell the stories of the Megans and the exceptional people who start these schools and the school leaders who make these dramatic decisions and think it's, you know, it's almost like disembodied, like it couldn't be us. But you know what? They were thinking the same thing, to, to Megan's point. So I just think it's, it's so much about us deciding, you know, each of us, that we're going to take the bold steps um, to ensure that, all of our kids have access to the most fundamental of all opportunities, you know, the, the opportunity to have the kind of education that enables them to, in fact, go ultimately make history themselves. Um, one last thing I want to say before uh, opening this up to a discussion. Um, I've just been so inspired about, I don't know, six or seven years ago or so, we started, or five years or whenever it was, we started hearing from entrepreneurs around the world, social entrepreneurs, who for one reason or another had come to be very passionate about the idea of enlisting their country's future leaders in addressing the problem of educational inequity. Um, and you know they were looking for help from, from Teach for America, from Teach First, um, which was the first adaptation of Teach for America that started about nine years ago in, in the UK. Um, and that led ultimately to the creation of Teach for All, which is a global network of now 19 organizations and growing. I'm sure we'll be 25 organizations strong in just a few months and 50 organizations strong in three years. Um, and so all over Latin America, you know, growing in the Middle East, across Asia and, and Europe, and soon to be Africa as well. Um, we've had the chance to, uh, through, through these other programs, gain some insight into what's happening in, in classrooms and education systems around the world. And, you know, there are many differences, to state the obvious, across cultures and countries. But the thing that has been 
so, um, you know, almost, I honestly would not have guessed this, but the universals in this are, are truly overwhelming. Um, I just saw a video, I sort of wish I had it here to play for you all, but of a teacher who just finished um, two years teaching in India, um, teaching in Pune in, in an extraordinarily under-resourced setting. Um, he literally, it's like Megan in India, like what he did to put his kids on a completely different life course through simply setting the big vision, getting them on a mission, operating purposefully and absolutely relentlessly, unbelievable. And, and as the group of leaders of these organizations comment inevitably every time we get together, it's like kids are kids and teaching is teaching. I honestly think that, I think that the reason we have the problem of educational inequity in the US, it, it's so similar all across the world and it means that the solutions are also so similar. Um, I'm now realizing in the US that, you know, as we look at what's happening in communities across the country in this education reform effort, which is gaining momentum in so many different places, we're starting to see such patterns in communities that go from, you know, being almost asleep as it relates to addressing this problem to being kind of the hotbeds of reform. There are certain kind of levers for change that lead there to be tremendous momentum in communities. And we're realizing here in, in our efforts at Teach for America that what this means is we can speed up the pace of change across the country by you know, seeding those levers among our alumni. Um, and what I'm now realizing is given the similarities in education systems and, and dynamics all around the world, you know, we're gonna be able to, to both you know, uh, speed up their pace of change, but then we're gonna learn so much. We're gonna learn so much from the brilliant teams, the brilliant teachers, the alumni, all over the world that's gonna end up speeding up our own efforts to ensure educational opportunity for all. And I just think there's something unbelievably inspiring to realize this is just gonna, it, the, the momentum's never gonna stop, it's gonna get faster and faster, and it's what leads me to really believe um, that it, it truly is within our reach to ensure that all kids attain an excellent education. We have a long way to go, but to me there's only one real question, which is whether enough of really our world's most promising future leaders will step up and decide that they're going to make this, you know, their fight. Um, so, thank you very much. Yeah. Hi. Uh, you mentioned the importance of having transformational leaders. So I was curious what your thoughts were, were on Michelle Ree's departure from D.C. and how that'll affect the D.C. schools. Um, well, you know, there's, uh, there, there, there's tremendous kind of, I guess, just foundations for change in D.C., hugely because of her leadership, um, but also because of, of a team of a whole bunch of other people in the city, including lots and lots of Teach for America alums. Um, you know, the whole, many of the folks in her senior team, including her deputy chancellor, were, were Teach for America folks. The new chancellor is... Kaya Henderson, um, who's committed to all the same, you know, things that Michelle was, um, and and is operating with as as much urgency and and maybe with a slightly different. I mean, she's just a different person with a different approach in terms of working with the community. Um, I actually was just talking with um, a woman named Kristen Ergood, a Teach for America alum, who's starting a whole advocacy organization there um, to build community support for these reforms. And it was so interesting to talk to her. She said, you know, our problem isn't the same as it is in a lot of other communities. We have the right union contract, we have the right policy set up, and it's about execution. And we need, you know, to enlist the community in the effort. We need to stay the course in terms of um, what's happening in the school system. So I'm really optimistic about uh, the future of, of Washington, D.C. My question for you is about um, standardized testing. As a, um, a daughter of a teacher and someone who's been involved in education myself, I've also I've often heard of the struggles of transformative teachers to also work in line with the state and national testing standards. Do you see those standards as being counterproductive to those transformational teachers? And if so, how do we reform these statewide and national standards that seem to be 
impeding our teachers? Hmm. You know, I, I mean, I think, as, as I guess you know, I mean, there's been a whole effort in the last uh, three or four years to encourage states to adopt common standards, you know, rigorous, high, internationally benchmarked standards. And I think, I think that's a hugely positive, positive thing. I mean, our te it's not, of course, the same as standardized testing. It's just what should our kids know at every grade level and in every subject? Without a real understanding of that, it's hard for teachers to know what to do. I think we need to invest in better and better assessments so that we can give our teachers better tools for understanding how are their kids doing against those standards. Um, but when you really get into it, any effective teacher is assessing their kids constantly. Um, like they're trying everything to understand where are their kids, what do they get, what do they not get, so that they can meet where they are and, and move them ahead. Um, so I think as long as, personally, I think the problem is, is generally, I mean, states have wide range of standardized tests. Some are better than others. We need to make them better and better. Um, but I do think we should be concerned if our kids are not passing low-level standardized tests. I mean, as parents, we would all really freak out if our, parent, or if our kids did not have the skills to do okay on whatever the state determines is the baseline. <laughs> it's just that we need to do more than that. You know, we need our educators to be so committed to ensuring that their kids gain the kind of education that enables them to go out and chart the course and make history, you know, and that's just, we need so much more than to be driving at those tests. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I wanted to follow up on uh, this, this gentleman's uh, question just because I, I moved out here from uh, DC as well and saw what uh, Michelle was able to do there. And then the sort of the reactionary forces that came out against her and Adrian Fenty and, and now are almost to the process of trying to tear down what, what she built up. And I wonder what your perspective is on the role of politi the political process and some of those reactionary entrenched interests and where you see the role of more traditional rather than say TFA teachers uh, and teachers unions and the role of performance and pay for performance and reward for performance and things like that in the teaching system? Um, you know, it's interesting. I think the perception of the kind of education reform community in DC is slightly different than, than is perceived outside of DC. Personally, I don't think the election in Washington, D.C. was a referendum against education reform. The new mayor appointed to head his transition team for education, you know, the board chair of Teach for America and another person who's in, on the national boards of both KIPP, one of the high-performing charter networks, and Teach for America. I mean, you don't do that if you don't believe in reform in some way. Um, and I think, you know, if anything, there, there's certainly as much energy working in the same direction that Michelle charted um, in DC today than there was before. So that, that's, just, that's just one thing I would say. That being said, I think we learned a lot. Michelle learned a lot. We all learned a lot in the last four years. And we realized that we need leadership everywhere in communities if we're going to pull this off. Like, we certainly need reform-minded union leadership if we can get it. Um, we also need, and we need, we need reform-minded district leadership, but we also need community leadership. And I think the efforts that we're now seeing in communities to rally parents, um, exceptional teachers, uh, and, and to put as much energy into creating effective advocacy organizations as we do into building effective schools and uh, you know, as we often do into just complaining about the unions. I mean, I guess that's the thing. Like, the unions need to protect their members. Like, that's actually their mission. So the question I would ask is, where's, where's the rest of the leadership? Like, we need leadership in our districts. We need to organize ourselves in communities to ensure that our kids have the chances they deserve. And I, I really believe that if we're all stepping back and working together and assuming leadership, to, to act on the lessons that we've learned in, in communities in the last 20 years, we're going to make serious change. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, this sort of touches on what you were just mentioning, but I feel that the ed reform movement often gets portrayed as an anti-teachers union movement, and especially in movies like The Lottery and Waiting for Superman. Um, and you just touched on that, the need for uh, reform and union leadership, but I'm wondering what you think the dangers are of 
being portrayed as an uh, anti-teachers union movement and our charter school is going to be sustainable without encouraging or supporting uh, teachers organizing into unions. Yeah. Thank you. I really worry about the state of the kind of national conversation right now for exactly the reason that you say. Um, and, you know, in a chance to make history, I, I talk about not only the lurch from one silver bullet to another, but, you know, the silver blame game. You know, we spent a lot of our last 20 years in this blaming kids and families. That was, you know, most people in America believe we have this problem because the kids aren't motivated in urban and rural areas, the parents don't care. And now, thanks to documentaries and various other forces, it, it's, it's the teachers and the unions. And I just think when you get into it, you realize this is far more complicated. This is, we are in, we have a deep systemic problem. We have this problem because kids in our urban and rural areas face many extra challenges. They show up at schools that in no way have the extra capacity to meet their extra needs. And as a result, anyone who's caught up in that starts looking dysfunctional. To blame, I'm not saying that, I mean, everyone needs to change in this picture, right? So yes, unions need to change, union contracts need to change, but to blame the unions for this problem, let me just say a couple things. First of all, teacher dismissal rates. There, there are states with extremely weak unions that are essentially non-issues, right? 1% of the teachers in those states are dismissed. It's something like 0.03 percentage points higher of teacher dismissal rates than in highly unionized states. Now, why do we have low teacher dismissal rates? Is it really because of the unions or is it because we have no tradition, no culture, no systems, no expectations at our, in our schools and school systems that we should actually be managing our teachers and evaluating them and developing them over time? So I, I just think, I really worry about, about blaming, especially groups of people in, whose investment and engagement we desperately need if we're actually gonna solve the problem. Yeah. I should probably, I don't know if I'm supposed to be reading all these. Am I supposed to read? Okay, okay. So, so should I take one of these and then you? Okay. Um, what role and responsibility, oh, they're up here too, okay. Do technology companies like Google have in addressing the current problems in education? Um, well, as I said earlier, I mean, I do really believe that the fact that we now know that it is truly possible to provide kids I mean, it, it's hard when you're like at the Google headquarters, no doubt, and for all of us as we sit in conference rooms and whatnot, to just stay really deeply aware of what is happening in our communities, in our country. You know, this country that has so many resources and aspires to the ideals that it aspires to. You know, 14% of the African American um, boys in Oakland graduate from high school. And the consequences of that, we all know. I mean, we have whole communities that send more African-American boys into prison than into college. Like, this is just a problem with huge human consequences, let alone, I mean, how much that holds back our democracy and our economy and all because of the potential we know the same kids have to actually go out and be hugely contributing members of society. Um, so knowing how massive the problem is and knowing that we can solve it, I mean, that's the new piece of information I feel like we have now that we really didn't have 20 years ago. Now that we know that, it's really on all of us um, to, to figure out how do, how do we get there for all kids. And, and I know there's so much commitment throughout Google to education. Um, and, and in fact, that there are many things going on at Google already in education. I think that is awesome and inspiring because I can't think of a place with more, you know, kind of brain power and uh, kind of innovation ability to, to kind of chart the course. And, and, and so I, I can't tell you what I think the answers are, but I guess I would just say, and, and I don't need to because you're also brilliant and can go find the answers, but I think I would say if you don't, if you haven't yourself, like if, if you're inspired to get engaged and do something about the problem, I would encourage you to go spend time in classrooms like 
Megan classrooms, transformational classrooms in transformational schools to really, I think there's a tendency to think we all know. We all know because we went to school, education, how hard can it be? You know what, there's something very different happening in these classrooms and schools. Again, nothing elusive, nothing so complicated, but it's very different than what we're used to. And I think understanding deeply what's happening in those schools and then grounding our innovations in the lessons there um, is, is one big thing I, I, would, I would suggest. I think there's such potential power in technology. We go about everything in education the hardest possible way. It's completely embarrassing when you think about it. You know, you think about what any company is doing today versus even five years ago in terms of how they work because of technology advances and nothing has changed. I mean, I mean, there are whiteboards now in schools in some cases and stuff, but nothing fundamentally has changed. And, and I think you all have the potential to, to speed up the pace of change on, on that front hugely. So I was kind of able to pull um, maybe two separate paradigms out of everything that you talked about that kind of uh, need changing as far as our education system goes. One starts with, uh, with the kids and, you know, dispelling the notion that a person's socioeconomic origins should and will uh, tell the story of their, their, uh, their yeah. condition, their educational situation later in life. And so that's one, and then the other kind of starts with the educators, with the the transformative, transform, transformational teachers that you talked about. Um, and obviously, the number of kids who get access to these, uh, you know, n this, to this new breed of uh, kind of alternative educator correlates directly to how many of the of of us of people we give access to become these transformational educators. And so it seems like. Paradigm number one is kind of, you know, for the most part, out of the kids' hands before they're, they're introduced to those opportunities, whereas paradigm number two is the one that we kind of have the more, more control over. And so my question is, what advice do you have for maybe people like me who, you know, want to become that, you know, have, find an opportunity to become that sort of person? And the reason I ask is that Teach for America, um, is geared so highly towards recent grads and to you know seniors in college considering what their next step is going to be and so my question is what do what does the you know so to speak mid career professional do who doesn't want to you know okay I don't want to completely give up my you know computer science background at Google to go get a teaching credential yeah. you know move somewhere start teaching but I do want to I you know get involved you know, in yeah. this, but I can't dedicate a year pre-career to it. Yeah. What do you, you know, how do we give both, because I'm personally curious, yeah. and I think because that's sort of the next step in expanding yeah. the scope of teachers, of transformational educators, how do we give those those people access to these yeah. opportunities? Um, so a couple things. First of all, we actually have a newly re-energized effort to recruit people who are still at the front end of their careers one to ten years out of college um, into Teach for America. We think it can be hugely powerful. I mean, as one small example of that, this year a second year Teach for America Corps member in Mississippi was the state teacher of the year. I mean, it's quite extraordinary, but she came to it with corporate experience. You know, she's something like 28. Um, and we have growing numbers of these folks. I mean, probably 15% of our incoming core, but growing, we're projecting to like 30% over the next five years. Um, so that's one thing. And, and I, I, I don't want to be recruiting, of course, away from Google here, but if you're leaving anyway and you really want to go work full time in education, I would actually seriously say, like, start with teaching. I, I, it is such a vital foundational experience to great educational leadership and, and educational advocacy long term. And I, I could go on and on about that. But once you've done what Megan's done, no one will ever shake her from the conviction. In fact, you know, that her kids have the potential to excel. And she has such a grounded understanding of what it actually takes. Um, I was I was just talking with a state senator in Colorado who's this young guy who's a Teach for America alum named Michael Johnston, who passed a law in his, you know, something like fifth month as a state senator, which essentially eliminated teacher tenure in Colorado. It, it gives principals control over who's in their building. It makes tenure contingent on affecting gains in student achievement. Incredible. 
and, and I was talking to another Teach for America alum who was kind of in and around uh, this whole effort, and he said, you know what, few people realize, like now everyone tells this story about this incredible guy who passed this law, rallied the civil rights communities, got one of the unions to actually support this. They said what few people realize is he fought back a hundred amendments that would have changed the nature of the law so that it sounded okay, but in reality, it didn't fundamentally change things. And you just think about that. It's like the perseverance he showed in saying no, no, no. Like, where did that come from? And when you know Michael, you realize it came from his kids and what he knew they had the potential to do and what he knew they weren't given. Um, and, and I talked to him. I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a tangent, but it, it just, I so believe that having taught yourself, I don't know, it not only fuels a different level of determination, but it, it gives you a different understanding of, of what the true drivers are. But what I would say if you aren't really looking for a full-time career switch um, is that absolutely like get involved. And I would just point out Emily Bobel here in the Bay Area. And of course, I know there are people all over the country. Reach out to the Teach for America folks in your community because we would love to hook you up with teachers who are dying for help like you could provide. Um, uh, and, and also, you know, reach out to some of these, these high-performing schools, which I'm sure would love partnerships that enable Google execs to spend time in, in their schools and to help make their efforts easier and more powerful through technology and whatnot. Yeah. Oh, I should, I sh I'm supposed to take another question. Okay. Um, many Teach for America participants leave after teaching after Teach for America. Do you see this as a problem? Uh, they're new teachers who don't really know what they're doing. Uh, do you see it as a problem that they leave before they're experienced and useful? Um, uh, you know what? Megan didn't know what she was doing. I, I don't know. I, what we have seen through our experience is that people with real leadership ability have the potential to make a life-changing difference in the lives of their kids, even in the first year and, and even in the second year. And in fact, the research would show that the Teach for America core members, you know, if, if you're assigned to a Teach for America core member, um, you know, you're at least as well off and in some cases even better off than even being assigned to an experienced teacher in your school. So for kids who are assigned to our teachers, it's certainly very responsible what, what we're doing. But what I would also say is, first of all, I think it's important that many of these people stay. The fact that 65% of these initially very unsuspecting Teach for America recruits end up devoting their whole lives to education is huge. We need long-term, sustained, committed leadership from within the system. 35% um, of our overall alumni pool of 20,000 folks are still teaching. We have 600 school principals. We have growing numbers of folks who are district superintendents and other district leaders. We have others who are working you know, to support the process in and around schools. And, but, but what I would also say is we need some of these people to leave. Um, all you have to do is teach to realize we're not going to solve this problem from within schools alone. Like, we need a lot happening within schools and school systems. But if we don't change the policy setup and the overall context in which our schools operate, we don't have a shot at the kind of meaningful transformational change we need for kids. We need more Michael Johnstons in the state of Colorado. I never finished the story, by the way. When I talked to him, he said, you know, last night I got my DREAM Act through the Senate. He got the, a bill that would give kids who do not have legal citizenship um, in-state tuition so that they could go to college, motivated entirely by one kid who he taught who made radical progress to catch up to where he could actually get into college in Colorado and then couldn't go. Um, because of all the challenges if, if you don't have legal citizenship. Unbelievable when you think about that. We need to get to the point where we have leaders at every level of policy. Uh, we need have the business leaders who do so much to inform our policy. We have the journalists who shape our public opinion, who understand what you understand after you've taught successfully in this context. Um, I tell a story about my eight-year-old interviewing me for a school paper in, in my book. And you know, at the end of this interview, he says, Mom, I've got one more question. He's interviewing me about the first year of Teach for America or something for this paper. And he's like, I don't really get it. Like, If this is such a big problem, why would you recruit people who are right out of college just to commit two years to solve it? 
And I thought, oh my gosh, um, this is why 20 years in, I'm still answering the same question every hour. Um, and, and it really is because it's just so counterintuitive, you know. But I guess I would just say this is a huge crisis. Crises demand out of the box solutions. Um, and, and what do we do when we have big crises in anything? We channel our best minds against the crisis. And, and that's really what Teach for America and the Teach for All programs are, are working to do. Yeah. Hi, Wendy. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah. My question is, is concerning kind of, I'm trying to gauge how much I live in a bubble or we at Google live in a bubble because people here are pretty excited about Khan Academy. And they've deployed. I am too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's an amazing, an amazing story. And, you know, they have the, the pilot in Los Altos, but obviously Los Altos is not the type of high schools that you're targeting. And, and what I'm wondering is, is how far away are we, though, from kind of being able to deploy a Khan Academy or using some of the teachings from Khan Academy about reversing the classroom, you know, quantitatively tracking everything. I mean, is this, is this a very distant future or, you know, kind of what is your sense of, you know, uh, being able to adopt some of that and, and maybe applying some of this technology that, that you know, Google's financing or, or you know, anyone's innovating out there on this? I don't think we have to be far away. I think, I guess I'd say a couple things. I mean, one, I haven't have had conversations even recently with, there's, there is a, far more than existed, say, 10 years ago. There's like reform-minded urban district leadership out there. And in some places, there actually is a lot of technology. Like you could actually implement it. Like in not every city, but in some places, for one reason or another, because of federal grants and whatnot, you have a level of technology capacity that's just sitting there not being utilized. So I, I, think, I think we can see a lot of this happen in, in the next few years. Um, and I think it has huge potential. And I myself think, I mean, I think the con stuff is like very, very inspiring. I'm, I'm a, I mean, the, the one little caveat I'll say is, I, I hope we don't get lulled into thinking that, that that's the latest silver bullet because in fact, we've already been lulled into thinking that. Like we've gone through in the last 20 years, the phases where we thought technology would solve the problem. Um, and it, it's incredibly helpful, but you still need the context of a school with a clear different mission than most schools have and a strong team and a strong culture or the technology just will, could even have unintended consequences. I, I write in A Chance to Make History about my visit last year to the School of the Future, which was a school created in Philadelphia by a big technology company um, that I mean, they spent $60 million put, you know, very well-intentioned, you know, some, a team of the, some of the best people on it designing, using technology to design a new way of educating. This school has managed to underperform the Philadelphia Public Schools. And I visited it last year and sat in the back of the only classroom that they will open to the public and watch the teacher who'd been there ever since the beginning talking as loud as he possibly could to try to get the kids' attention. You know, the kind of teachers I'm talking about, like, and, and I watched every single kid, and I'm not exaggerating, was doing one of three things. Taking the battery out, you know, trying to start the computer, their laptop, I am in their friends, or surfing the internet. No exaggeration. And it would have been comical, literally, if you hadn't realized these are 10th graders in Philadelphia. They've written off their lives. I mean, literally, their options. And, you know, less than a mile away, there's a school in a building that's been in Philadelphia forever with no redesigning, which is putting all of its kids on a path to having college acceptance in order to graduate. And all of them are graduating. It's like got a different leader, different mission, different culture, different team. Everyone's aligned on the same mission. So we, we sort of need both, you know, but we just need to be careful, I think. Am I too greedy to ask for another question? Sure. <laughs> um, just another question, this is unrelated to technology, but just the cons, uh, you know, I hear college being described often as like kind of the end goal or college level. Yeah. And I also, but then I, I, I struggle to reconcile that with also this, the economic challenges faced by, by colleges and what that puts on society and how, you know, can we really support such a large college educated populations given the escalating costs and kind of what are your, what are your thoughts on, you know, what, it, you know, what is the kind of post high school options and is, is maybe that's too broad of a question but i mean i find that these yeah. two kind of goals some are somehow kind of escalating away from each other and causing causing kind of economically structural i mean i think it's a good question i think someone should probably start looking at whether we've got all of our higher ed thinking straight but i do think that as long as right now 
The reality is that a ticket to the full range of professional options is college, and it doesn't make sense that one in 10 of our low-income kids get a college degree when you know 85% of our high-income kids do. So I, I, someone needs to take that on too, though. So thank you so much, you all.